Thank you all for coming this afternoon uh, to our class we've been doing regarding church membership. And uh, we'll begin uh, with prayer and then we'll read our passage of scripture, which will be from Hebrews 10, beginning with verse 19. And, uh, and kind of just do a real quick review of what we've done so far and then get into our subject for today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day of worship and fellowship and the study of your word that you've given to us. May, Father, we think upon you deeply today. May we receive the instruction of your word. Father, there's so many ideas and thoughts out there today about what the church ought to be, what church membership should be. Lord, may we speak that which is biblical and which honors you and, and is accurate as far as what uh, you believe the church should be and, and what we should be in it. In your holy name we pray. Amen. So, I'm going to read verses 19 here uh, through uh, about 27. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus by the new and living way that he has opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning deliberately after we receiving the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. So stop there. So the intent in when we began this was for really more for people that are not members that have been visiting for some time and want to know uh, about what how Faith Baptist and what we believe as far as about church membership. So I've done my best to draw from a number of resources uh, because this is really the first time that I have taught on this, but mainly the resource of the scriptures. Uh, but the purpose, as we said initially to begin with, was to show the biblicality of church membership the benefits of church membership, the necessity of church membership, the duties of church membership, the essential doctrines of the church, and what a biblical church looks like. And so we've covered the history of Vice Baptist. We've talked about the biblicality of church membership. We've talked about the benefits of church membership. We've talked about the necessity of church membership. And so what we're really going to get in today are about the duties of church membership. Now you start talking about duties and people kind of get, you know, you're going to get all legalistic on me. Uh, but as the scriptures plainly teach uh, about these other areas, I believe that there are duties or uh, responsibilities that we have as far as church membership that are laid out in the scriptures. As I've said, we use the analogy of a body. Every member of the body benefits from the other members. If one member is not functioning and is not doing what it should, then uh, you can, uh, the, the whole body suffers. It's like, you know, uh, as we age in the physical bodies, some of the, some of the members uh, don't work as well as they used to. <laughs> so your body doesn't work as well as it used to. Uh, the hip may uh, not work as well as it used to, or the knee, or your uh, shoulder or anything along those lines. So that kind of hinders the function of the body. Well, the duties and the responsibilities of church membership, by fulfilling those, we are benefiting. We don't look at it as, oh, this is a weight on my back, but we should look on it as members of the body as this benefits other members of the body. Uh, and so this is what we're going to talk about today. What are the duties... Uh, and the uh, responsibilities of church membership in the local New Testament church. And I believe that we can look at the scriptures and find the biblical basis for this. Uh, and so, you know, we, we don't teach things that you can't, don't have a biblical basis for. 
Uh, there are things that are practiced by churches as far as tradition. I won't get into those so much, but that are not bi- really biblically based. But let's begin with this. And the first really thing, the first duty of church membership uh, and responsibility is faithful attendance. <laughs> uh, if you're going to be a member of a body, you need to faithfully attend. Uh, one of the things that in the past when we've sat down individually with people and talked about church membership is that we don't believe in non-participatory or non-attending church membership. Now, I'll be honest with you, growing up a lot of my life, uh, you would have be in churches where you would have, let's say, 250 members and you only had somewhere between the 50 and 100 people that basically came somewhat semi-regularly. Well, that ought not to be. Uh, That's an aberration that has propagated itself in our society in which people tend to think, well, I'm a member down there. Uh, They don't really need me to be there. I can't really contribute anything, uh, but I still want to keep my membership. Well, you know, that's one of the things here that we have as far as the area of church discipline is if you don't attend for a certain period of time that you don't get to maintain your church membership. Uh, And so the first duty is faithful attendance, uh, particularly on the Lord's Day. Now, we have some other functions of the church. We have the the men and women's Bible studies that we're doing now. Uh, You know, most of the time it's Monday night, sometimes Tuesday. We have the corporate prayer on Wednesday nights. Uh, And I encourage people to come to those. But particularly on the Lord's Day or Sunday, uh, you need to be regular in your attendance on that day. Uh, And so, you know, this is what when when, uh, the early New Testament church uh, began, they started meeting on the first day of the week instead of it changed from uh, the Sabbath or from Saturday. But the writer of Hebrews says, let us hold fast this confession of our hope without wavering. He's faithful promise. Well, how do you do that? Well, let us not let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together. The habit of some is to neglect that, but we encourage one another in our attendance, being there regularly. And so, more as you see the day approaching, the day of Christ, the second coming of Christ, I think is what is being taught here. But it is through this regular attendance of uh, the Lord's house, the place where we are members, that we grow through particularly the ministry of the Word of God. This is how we are nourished. We are saved through the ministry of the Word. We're born again, uh, as Peter talks about, through the Word of God, the incorruptible Word of God. But we also, after that, we grow through that. We grow, as he sa- as Peter also said, through the sincere milk of the Word. That's how we grow. We are to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I will say that you cannot do that without faithful attendance to the house of God. You cannot do it. I will just categorically say that. It's an, it is, it, people may think that they can, but you are not going to grow spiritually. You're not going to be encouraged by other believers if you are not a member of a body and not in regular attendance in that particular body. So we grow through the Word of God. Uh, We're encouraged by the Word of God. We are sanctified by it. We are reproved by it when we need to. Sometimes the Word of God uh, is preached. It doesn't encourage us. It reproves us because it points out some sin in our life or some way in which we have drifted away from Christ. Uh, if you look in, you know, you look in the messages to the seven churches of Asia Minor in Revelation, you see that five out of the seven were reproved by that. And so there's more reproof there among those than there is commendation. And probably that's probably pretty good for us. We probably we we need we need encouragement, but we probably also need a lot of admonishment. We need a lot of reproof uh, because it is easy to drift away from Christ to 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 let our love for Christ grow cold as the church at Ephesus uh, is seen there. You know, we have the great book of Ephesians and the great doctrine there, but you get over to Revelation and the messenger there says, uh, you've left your first love. Uh, so those things can happen and we need that reproof. 
uh, of that but we, and the encouragement and the growth. But we also benefit by regular attendance in God's house. We benefit from the fellowship of other believers. Uh, I'm not going to go back into all of that because we've looked at Acts 2, we've looked at Acts 4, we looked there in the early chapters of the book of Acts and we see how those believers fellowshiped a lot together. They were with each other a lot and they, I believe that they were encouraged through their regular attendance and their regular fellowship together. So if you are a member of a body, one of the duties of that is faithful attendance so that you can encourage other believers and so that you yourself might be encouraged. Because we are all, uh, what is it, Chris, and come thou found, prone to wander, <laughs> prone, to, prone to leave the God I love. Even though we love the Lord, there's still sometimes we get down. Let's be honest. Uh, sometimes we wander away because of either worldliness. Sometimes we get down and depressed. People talk about depression and everything in these days. Uh, read the Psalms. <laughs> Look at David's life. He was depressed many times. You think about all those years we've been studying 1 Samuel in the men's Bible study and he spent a good portion of the early part of his life running from Saul, hiding in caves, living in foreign places. And so... As believers, we are prone to those things and, pro and, and we are social creatures. God created us as social creatures. We need that encouragement that comes from other believers in Christ. Uh, some of the greatest encouragements I've, I've had, uh, unbeknownst to others, is somebody comes in, hey, man, you were just on my mind this week. I've been praying for you. And it may have been a week when I was down in the dumps, you know, uh, emotionally or something like that, something that had a difficult week perhaps. Uh, but we need those encouragements or there's a particular sin. you know, And that's one of the things too. Uh, we need people that we can share you know, with as far as sin problems in our lives. We, need to, oh, we, all, we all need accountability. Well, none of us are islands. We all need accountability. If, I, if I'm having a particular problem in my life that I'm dealing with, I'm struggling with things spiritually, I want to know that I'm a part of a body of believers and I can go to a brother in Christ. As a man, I think that's who I should go to. A brother in Christ and say, Hey brother, let me share something with you. Can you pray with me and for me about this? All of us need that. There is no person on earth that does not need that. Uh, and you're not so strong spiritually that you do not need that. I'm not so strong spiritually that I don't need it. And I see, I look, in, I look in, in the writings of Paul and we can tell there were times that he was down. He was, you know, uh, had difficulties that came in his life. That he needed the spiritual encouragement of other believers. And so that's one of the benefits there of this faithful attendance. And, and exercising spiritual gifts. We've talked some about spiritual gifts. And the place, the only place that you're really going to be able to use that spiritual gift in reality, reality is within the church. Within the recognized, the visible body of Christ. Uh, if you have a, a gift of, of serving, you need to be in a body to be able to do that, to help others, tangible people that are in your midst. If you have a gift of, of giving, so to speak, uh, of your time and your money, there needs to be a place where you give that. Uh, I had a conversation recently not long ago with somebody talking about that he really was not a member of a body. And he says, you know, I'm giving my money to different charitable organizations. Well, that's good, but you're... you're, you're Man, I'm going to get ahead of myself. But you need to be giving of yourself those things God has gifted you with to that body of believers. And so the only way you're going to do that consistently is if you're faithful in your attendance to that place. Uh, if you're going to be, you know, it, it's in the church that, that we are, that we learn about being, we're taught, you know, uh, about this uh, about this, how we're benefited. Let me, I'm trying to get the words out of my mouth here. Uh, imagine this. I mean, let me give this example. Imagine a husband and wife relationship, okay. How much benefited would the, would the home be if you had one or the other of those parties saying, well, I'm only going to be a part-time husband 
or I'm going to be a part-time wife in the home. It would be great detriment to that home if that happens, and you see that sometimes. In the same way, how much blessing and how much benefit can you be to a church body if you're inconsistent in your attendance to that place? You're inconsistent in that. You're not really going to be able to benefit that. And my, my belief is if you know, to show your love for other believers, to show your love for Christ, you need to be a part of a body in a formal way and to be faithful in your attendance to that place. And I believe this. I believe that God's people want to be in God's house with other of God's people. Uh, and, we, and David talks about this, you know, I've quoted this before, Psalm 122 and 1, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And I'm not going to read through all of these, but go to Psalm, this is maybe more like homework, Psalm 42, Psalm 63, Psalm 84, where David talks there about the joy of going to God's house and going up to worship with the people of God and, and seeing the power and the glory of God in the sanctuary. Uh, this is where you're going to see God move in the lives of people. This is where you're going to get encouraged by going to God's house with God's people and hearing God's word. It, it's a great preventative, for, as I've already said, for spiritual coldness, for backsliding, uh, you know, those things. It, it's really a good preventative. Now... People say, well, what about providential reasons? Yeah, there are providential reasons for missing. Uh, let's be honest. Uh, a lot of the reasons that people give are not really providential. If you're ill or you're taking care of somebody that's ill maybe uh, in an invalid situation, uh, yes, that's providential, I would say. There are providential unforeseen circumstances or emergencies that happen uh, in the family. But things such as, well, I'm just, I was just, I'm too tired <laughs> to get up. I was up too late on Saturday night. Uh, I've just had a hard week and I don't really feel like going today. You can do that, but that's not really a providential reason. Uh, you're going to suffer spiritually because of that if you don't go. Uh, it's like if you say, you know, it's like I'm going to just start skipping meals and not eat. Well, you can do that. Uh, now, I don't do that. Everybody can see that I don't do that. But, uh, but you're going to suffer health-wise. You're going to suffer energy-wise by that. You're going to suffer spiritually by not consistently being in God's house and, uh, and, and being there with the fellowship of the people sitting under the ministry of the Word. So, anyway, so that's the first thing, faithful attendance. The second thing I want to talk about is faithful service. We've already kind of touched on that. That all of us as believers are called to serve the Lord. We're all servants. What was it that the Apostle Paul called himself so often? There's a Greek word. I don't know if some of you guys know. I know Chris will know. Doulos. A servant, but it really should be titled a slave. It's really the correct, uh, the correct uh, translation of that. Uh, the, the translations don't do justice when they say just serve. Yeah, uh, it should be a slave of the Lord. And we're all really slaves or servants to other people within the body. We already read, I read this morning from Philippians chapter 2, that for our prime example, we see Christ, did we not? You know, that he uh, became a servant. He became a slave to us and lay you in, in, in great humility and willingly laid down his life for us, willingly left the throne of heaven to come down here and to be a servant among men. And so, and so we see that and we see it, you know, in his life primarily and we see it in the, in the lives of the early Christians, in the early church. Look at Acts chapter 2 again. You look at that and you see what they did. They had that mentality of serving others above themselves, of living for others above themselves, of living for Christ, uh, certainly above themselves. If you look in Acts 2, and there in verses 45 and 46, it says they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the needs, the proceeds to all as everyone had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. They were giving away. They were serving the Lord by giving, giving away 
uh, what they had and serving others. And then, of course, in Acts chapter 6, uh, in those first seven verses, there were some things that came about uh, because of needs of the widows in that day. And I'm not going to read all of that, but that speaks there about what we call the establishment of the first deacons. Um, the word uh, that is used there, it comes from the word diakonos, which has to do with common work, common labor kind of a thing. And so these widows needed to be taken care of. And so these men already were living this example of being uh, what we would for better, lack of a better word, deacons already. They were servants within the church doing work. And so the, the church said, we want to pick out these guys that are of good reputation. They're full of the Spirit and they're full of wisdom. You know, and and that's, that's the way it ought to be even today. That if you're going to pick out deacons, you pick out guys that are full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom, and are already servants. They're seen as already that. But that's not just for, for any particular class of Believers also, it's also for all common believers. Uh, if you want to turn over in Romans chapter 12 there for just a minute, it, uh, the Apostle Paul talks about this. Now we're going to come back to verse 1 here in a minute of Romans 12. And he's already talking here about uh, giving yourselves as a living sacrifice. And certainly if we see ourselves as giving as, ourselves as a living, living sacrifice to the Lord, we're also doing that in regards to others. Uh, and I'm going to begin with verse 4. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. And then he says, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what's good. And he goes on down there, do outdo one another in showing honor. Don't be slothful in your zeal. Be fervent in spirit. So it really addresses this issue of service. And so we're doing this out of obedience to the scripture. God has called us here. And, he, and we have a conviction. This is the place where God wants me. And so I'm going to use these gifts and I'm going to emulate what the Apostle Paul speaks out. But what he's really talking about here is service to other believers. Service first to the Lord and service to other believers. And the service to other believers is grounded in our service to the Lord, is it not? This is how Jesus said, this is how they're going to know your love for me and that you love one another. Well, how does, how do we, how does that love seem? Well, it's done in, in many times in actual acts of service. As he says up there in Romans 12 and verse 1, I appeal to you therefore by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And so what he's talking, give these bodies up for the service of Christ. And you do that, have your body in church. <laughs> have your body in the Lord's house. Join and use the, and ask, Lord, how can I use myself, what you have given me uh, to serve other believers, to serve you and to serve other believers. Uh, I still remember uh, I, I don't know if it, I don't think it was original. I still remember my father talking about. He says, "I don't want to rust out for Christ. I want to burn out." So we use these bodies to burn out for Christ in the service of others. Uh, you know, in the service and the service of Christ. And Paul talked about that. We've already given uh, maybe the example. I don't know that I gave a specific scripture. But in 1 Corinthians 9 and 19 and Galatians 1 and 10, he talks about this doulos idea, being a servant for the Lord. Uh, and then we've already mentioned about what Christ's example of being a servant there. And so, you know, in, in doing this, the church is benefited and built up spiritually. You want others to be benefited by your service? Then join yourself to a body and get in there and serve. There's always things to do. I'll guarantee you there are always things to do in church. Uh, some people think that the only service there is in the church is getting up and, and teaching or something like that. There's a whole plethora of things to do. Uh, let me see. Uh, floors need to be swept. Air filters need to be changed out. Grass needs to be mowed. 
all of those kind of things. And um, any of us that have been here any amount of time have done all of those things, including your pastor. Now, I'm not bragging about that, but, but we should not any of us see ourselves as above others in regards to serving the Lord within the body and within the church. Okay? So, faithful attendance, faithful service, and here, faithful giving. <laughs> Faithfully giving to the Lord's work. Uh, and I think that this is one thing that, you know, this is usually a touchy subject when you talk about giving to, to the Lord's work. And people often ask the question, uh, are we commanded to tithe in the New Testament? Of course, we know uh, Malachi 3, 8 through 10, uh, bring all your tithes into the storehouse. Uh, and per se, tithing is not commanded, but also Jesus, when he was talking about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, he told the apostles, don't do their works, but do these other things. They're tithing. Do as they do. So I think that there is somewhat of an intimation there, at least by Jesus, that we should at least be giving uh, regularly as they did, but don't do their hypocritical works. Uh, and so there's this biblical principle, I think, established back in the Old Testament of a consistent giving to the Lord's work. Uh, now, a lot of people argue about, you know, was that 10%? Well, I need to figure out exactly what 10% of my salary is uh, so uh, that I can know exactly to the penny what I'm supposed to give. If that's kind of how you think about it, that you don't want to give any more than exactly 10%, you're thinking wrong. You're thinking wrong. Our giving, um, as the Apostle Paul taught, and we're going to touch on some of those scriptures, is a proof of our love of Christ. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that someone would come and be a member of the body and be a part of the body and not want to con and benefit from the from the body and let others do all the giving and they don't. Now, uh, you know, and I know that kind of a, that's a touchy subject, but I think it's in truth that we find in the scriptures that it is necessary. Uh, these lights don't come on magically. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Swepco expects a payment every month. Uh, the water bill has to get paid every month. Other things have supplies have to be bought. All this coffee <laughs> that we drink around here, uh, things like that. Now, uh, that's not a necessary thing. If we had to cut it out, we could. And some of you could do without it easier than others. Uh, but, uh, but, but you understand these things. Missions, let's get down to a more serious note. Giving the missions could not be done without the, the consistent giving of the people of the body. So uh, we should be giving, uh, you know, we should be giving consistently. Uh, and I ask this question. I say, well, you want to tell me, I've heard people talk, well, I'm not commanded. You're under the law, they were commanded to tithe. But I don't really give because we're not commanded to. So you're going to tell me that you're going to give less under grace than they did under the law, under legally. I think that personally we should be giving more under grace. Now, you know, I don't. I don't know what anybody gives. Let me just give that caveat. Uh, but I, I do believe that it is wrong and sinful to come to God's house and partake of the blessings of God and not give to the work of God. I believe that. Uh, take that as you will. And I believe the scriptures will bear me up. So, so what does it say if we don't give consistently to the church about our commitment to the Lord and our love for the Lord's kingdom and love for the Lord's church. A couple of scriptures uh, we can look at. Go back over to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to read two passages of scripture. First, first verse 21 and then verse 33. And Jesus says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And he's talked there about not laying treasures up for yourselves on earth. And not when lay, up treasure, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Well, what are most people busy about in this day and time on this earth? 
Well, I'm saving up for my retirement. Now, let me say this. I don't believe it's wrong to put money in 401ks and, uh, and retirement, uh, as long as you remember also when you get to that point in time that you need to continue to give to the Lord's work. Uh, in that. It's not just for the pleasure of our lives. But then look on down to verse 33 here in uh, Matthew 6. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. I hear people say sometimes, oh I can't afford to give. Uh, And it's hard for me to believe in our culture uh, that you can't give it all. Uh, And like I said, I'm, I'm not, you know, I my thing is consistently giving, con- consistently giving a fixed amount at least to the Lord's work uh, in that. Um, maybe there are things that occur in life that happens that perhaps you might have to suspend for a time of being, but I- I'm going to be really honest with you. I- I'm, I'm real kind of suspicious of those things that that's more earthly-minded thinking than it is heavenly-minded thinking. Uh, in, the, in those regards. Uh, Paul talks about it also over in Galatians chapter 6. And there um, in verse 6, the Apostle Paul there, uh, and he's talking here about, about those that benefit from the teaching of the Word of God. Let the one who has taught the Word share all good things with the one who who teaches. What's he saying about? Let the one who benefits from the ministry of the word and the ministry of the church, let them share in their goods so that that ministry can continue basically, so that that word can continue to be preached and taught and you benefit spiritually. So, and I think one of the the things that we have to remember sometimes and and think about, are we giving more uh, to to our kingdom? Are we spending more Uh, money toward our kingdom and it's building up or to God's kingdom? And I think that's a question we have to ask sometimes. Uh, But I think that that those of us who are uh, laying aside and saving consistently for uh, our, uh, you know, uh, for the future need to keep in mind to give also of that uh, during that particular point in time. But there's, there's a lot of New Testament scriptures that talk about regarding giving in the New Testament. Uh, we've already talked about, we've already read Acts 2, 45 and 46 there. And uh, there's also the examples in Acts 4, 34 through 35 where they were giving so that the needs of others could be taken care of. And we've done that from time to time for the needs of the saints. Uh, but the Apostle Paul uh, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 there, uh, he's talking there about the collection for the saints. Uh, there in chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do on the first day of every week, each of you, he doesn't give an exclusion here, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. Uh, so what he says there is basically... You put aside, you give it on the first day of the week, and then when I come and take this collection for the needs of others, other believers, then it will already be there. Uh, So uh, there's definitely, it it appears in this that he's commanding them to do this in that. Uh, If you go over, you know, in in, uh, 2 Corinthians, in chapter 8 and 9, and let me say this, you know, Read 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 because 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 are really all about giving and giving to the church and giving to the Lord's work and how this ought to be done. Uh, If you look there in the first nine verses there, uh, he talks about there, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generous, generosity on their part. They were in extreme poverty, he says here, but they've exhibited grace in that they have given extremely. Their poverty did not cause them to give less. It appears that it caused them to give more out of that. Uh, and so their, their example is a testimony in that. Uh, and so, you know, 
as he goes on down there to verse 7, he says, As you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and all earnestness and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. He is saying there that giving is an act of grace. We give out of the grace of God. We are sharing with others uh, because of what God has done for us. It's a, an example. Uh, and so in, again in the chapter 9 he talks about this for the collection for believers. It is superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry for the saints for I know your readiness of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia saying that Achaia has been ready since last year and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I'm sending the brothers. And so he's talking here again about the giving. And he says, you go on farther down, the, the verse 6, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap abundantly. Now, don't misuse this to think my giving is going to mean that I'm going to get more. I'm going to make more money. I'm going to have more money coming in the coffers. That's not what that's teaching. The health and wealth guys might teach that, but that's not what that's teaching. But you're going to benefit spiritually if you are open-hearted in giving toward the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and he said, everyone must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We should all be cheerful givers. Uh, not just give out, of, uh, give out of a legal obligation, uh, but we should give and give cheerfully. And I think that's really these passages of Scripture, and there's other Scriptures that deal with this, but I think but what is taught here and what we can find in, the, in this New Testament teaching is that we are to give faithfully in the church. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is faithful praying. Faithful praying. Now, I've given this example before, so I won't really go back to it, but you can write this down. Acts 1 and 13, about when Jesus had ascended back to the Father and the group of believers went back there and it says they gathered together. What did they do? They prayed. They gathered together to pray. Uh, one of the foundation marks of the early church, as we see there in Acts 2 and 44, is prayer. Uh, and so that was a consistent thing. We look over to Acts 4 and 31. The church was gathered together to pray. And then uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, I mentioned this morning about the, uh, the spiritual armor of Christ. Uh, and, and talks about there in verse 18 that we're to pray at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. What a supplication means, I'm praying for somebody. I'm praying for some person. And this is one of the great things about you know, the, the prayer list that we send out on the computer or that we print out uh, every Sunday uh, is that we can take that list and I can see, okay, here is David's needs. Here is Paul's needs. Here is Melanie's needs or Mary's needs or... Hannah's needs. <laughs> you know, but you have those there so that you can supplicate for those people at the throne of God. If you, don't have, if you don't have a church family that you are a part of, you're not going to pray consistently. You're not going to have consistent supplication for other believers. You don't have a church or a church body that you can pray for consistently. And I believe this, that prayer is supplicating prayer, uh, worshipful prayer, uh, corporate prayer, individual prayer is absolutely essential to the Christian life. You are not going to be, for lack of a better term, very hot spiritually, very uh, growing spiritually without a consistent prayer life. It's just not, it's not going to happen. And and in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17 says, pray without ceasing. Well, I believe that that is good both for the individual believer. I believe it's good in our homes that we should be praying amongst our families. Uh, we should be praying there. And when we come together, we should be praying. Uh, now, I hope I don't offend anybody in this, but the most poorly attended services in Faith Baptist Church are prayer meetings. Let's just be honest. That, that's it. Why is that? Well, I've heard this said before. You do what you want to do. <laughs> you're, faith, you're faithful to what you want to do. Uh, and so that's needed. And I've, I've heard talk about, you know, uh, seeing moves of God in the past. And, 
what I see in, consistently in history is there's never been any great moves of God in the church or in a nation until there is a hunger and a desire for prayer, for fervency in prayer. So are we faithful in seeking the Lord in our personal lives in prayer? As you've got to start with yourself. You've got to start with yourself in praying for yourself and also then for others and then praying for others. And are we going, joining together to, with our church and, and families in, in corporate prayer? And you see that in that early church there, that they had that hunger for prayer and that desire to seek the Lord in prayer. And you see it, you know, uh, throughout history. And so faithful praying, I think, is essential. You pray, you pray for yourself, you pray for others, you pray for the propagation of the gospel. Paul said, pray for me, you know. Uh, for unction, the unction of the Lord might be upon me, the moving of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit, and then the conviction of the Spirit upon sinners. Uh, all, you know, I, I, that old song, and I quote it probably more frequently than I ought to, Brethren, we have met to worship. And all is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. And that's true. Uh, you know, I can preach passionately and teach passionately, but if the Spirit of God does not anoint that preaching and, and anoint those in the congregation, there's not going to be any impact really. We need that moving of the Spirit and really we see that happen in places where great prayer is made for the church and for, for other believers. Then another thing uh, as far as a duty or responsibility of believers, faithful submission. Faithful submission. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13 uh, verse 17. Um, We'll read that. And what the writer here says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So what's he talking about here? He's talking about submitting to the leadership of the church. There's lined out leadership in the church. There's bishops, elders, pastor, teachers. Uh, there were apostles still around at this particular point in time, but he's talking here about submitting to those that are keeping watch over your souls. This is not, let me say this. Yeah, I've had people, you know, because most of you know, I'm a bivo, you know, bivocational. I've worked in a secular job and, and pastored now together for 28 years. And they say, oh, well, you're a part-time pastor. I said, no. <laughs> I'm a part-time medical technician. <laughs> I'm a full-time pastor. There's never a time when as a pastor or an elder that you are part-time. You are always have those burdens, if you're biblical, that you always have those burdens upon your mind and your heart for the people that you are pastor over. There is never a time, there is never really a moment of the day that let that leaves your mind. And so what he says here is be, be in submission to them. Now, he doesn't say be in submission to them because they're perfect. Uh, if you wanted to know, you know, I mean, you, you've all, a lot of you have known me a long time, uh, at least back here at this table. And actually, Paul and May have known me for a long time too. <laughs> Just hadn't been members here for a long time. But you know why, and here's my daughter sitting down here, my wife sitting back there. They know good and well that I'm not perfect. And you've seen me in, even in some of the things that I've done not being perfect. <laughs> but my heart is for the, for the Lord and for the, the people that God has put here. I love all the people that God has put within this body. I do. I love each and every one of you. I pray for all of you. You know, and so we submit to those, and I've been in places too. Before I didn't start pastoring until I was 38, I was in other churches. Uh, and so I was under the, really, my father was my pastor for a long time. Uh, and then I had other pastors along the way. I didn't always maybe agree with everything that they did. But if what they were asking as far as me to do or for the direction of the church was not unbiblical, I submitted to them. I submitted to what they saw as the, as the biblical direction for the church. Now, if I was in a church and I, and I had, had an elder or a pastor that was asking me to do something unbiblical and they wouldn't change their tune or whatever like that, then it would probably be time to move on. <laughs> but if, if, you, if a person is in a member of a body and they have 
they have joined in membership to that church. They are submitting to the leadership of that church as that leader or leaders uh, is directed under the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. So, uh, so that's what we do, faithful submission. And then, and then last of all, I think this faithful in the pursuit of our progressive sanctification. Uh, I think all of us, as, you know, as Apostle Paul said back over there in Romans 12 and 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, we are all should be seeking to be growing in grace. We all should be seeking to be more conformed to Christ, uh, to be growing in holiness practically. Uh, we, all, and we all should constantly be looking at our lives and saying, am I, in holy, am I growing in holiness? You know, we should all be able to look back, let's say, a year ago and say, am I growing in holiness? Am I more sensitive to uh, the things of God and to what my life looks like in the, in the eyes of God and to others than I was a year ago? Uh, we should not be growing colder as we get older in our, our walk with the Lord, but we should be growing more in holiness and practical sanctification. The scripture says without holiness, no one is going to see God. Nobody. And the scripture, the apostle Paul took, so, talks a lot back over there, beginning over there in Ephesians chapter 4 about putting off and putting on and putting off and putting on and putting off, put off the old man and put on the new man. Are we actively, as a member of this body, seeking to do that? Are we consistently doing that? Uh, because our spiritual life, our spiritual growth affects the rest of the body. And like I give the, the terms of the physical body. Uh, you know, I've never really broken many, many members, but I remember when I was a kid one time, I broke this middle finger. It affected the rest of my body because I was in a lot of pain. Uh, another time, uh, I remember I kicked a chair, not in anger, <laughs> but accidentally, and it broke a toe. It was going out at a 45 degree angle. I knew that I'd broken it. Did it affect the rest of my body? Sure, yes, <laughs> it did, you know. Uh, and others in this body have had more serious things that have happened to them. It affects the rest of the body. What I'm saying about this is, Seek the Lord daily in regards to your walk with Him. Am I walking in a way that pleases Him? Because that, you know, has to do with our practical sanctification. And if I, and if I begin to slide, uh, I hate to use the term backslide as overused, but if truly if I'm a believer, if I backslide or I'm growing cold in my relationship to the Lord, it affects this body. And, I, and, and whether you know it or not, uh, it's seen. It's noticed. Uh, I, uh, you know, you kind of get a, a sense as a pastor a lot of times as the overseer of the body. When you see things that show up in people's lives that, that indicate there is something going on there. And then that's part of one of the responsibilities of an elder, a pastor, teacher. But, but there is a personal responsibility for us to examine ourselves uh, when we, you know, in the Lord. Uh, and to examine ourselves, and that happens should be happening at least every the first Sunday of every month when you come to the Lord's table, you need to be examining yourself. I hope you do it more frequently than that. But to be examining ourselves, am I walking with the Lord faithfully? Am I growing in holiness practically and in sanctification? And so those are, I'm sure there are more that I could add to that list, but those are the things I think that I see as the, really the primary duties and responsibilities as far as church membership. And so that was primarily what I wanted to bring out today, and I'm hoping the next time that we uh, gather together uh, on a uh, Sunday afternoon to, to finish this up uh, with a couple of things. Did anybody have any comments or questions or anything? Oh, there. Okay. And if you don't want to ask it out loud here, you can <laughs> shoot me a text or give me a call or send me an email about it. Well, let's dismiss in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the instruction of your word. Father, you haven't left us just to guesswork in, in how the church should work and how we should behave in the church of God. 
And so, Lord, I pray that this has been clear. And, Father, if there are those things that are to be added to, then pray you will reveal that to us uh, as a church body. Lord, we thank you for the ministry of your word to us today. We pray, Father, your Holy Spirit will take those things that we've heard and it will encourage us if we need that encouragement. Convict if we need to be convicted. And Father, I pray even today that the preaching of your word will cause someone to seek you in salvation. In your holy name we pray. Amen.